titled this sermon, Save Me. And the reason why I've said save me, because I remember many years ago I was in my father's boat, and I've told this story many times, I, I was getting washed out the channel at Lake Centre into my father's boat, because the engine had failed, and I eventually went for the radio, and I said, save me. Well, I didn't really, I said, this is OZ 120, Lakes, come in, please. <laughs> and uh, they got back to me, and they gave me some incredible instructions. They said, have you thrown the anchor out? And I thought... There's a great idea to get the ball rolling. And then they got back to me, and the next instruction said, if they got your life jacket on, it's like, there's another great idea. And they were full of great ideas. And eventually, uh, the surf rescue came and rescued me, and I got back, and I discovered what the real problem was, is that my fuel tank had no fuel in it. <laughs> and that's why my engine stalled, and that's why I couldn't get it started. And so I was literally getting washed out the channel because of my own absolute stupidity and foolishness, yet I was crying out, save me. Now, I'm a Christian. Should not God have filled my tank? <laughs> like, he, we're saved by grace, aren't we? Then why didn't God save me? Why didn't I? Why, why, yes, he did. But my point is, a, a lot of people don't get saved in those situations. But my point is, why didn't God magically fill my petrol tank with fuel? I think we all know the answer is because that's not what salvation is all about. Now, look, I have been a pastor in this church for some time. I've been here in this church for 20 years. And I just want to take a, 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 just a, a segment, just a small slice of 20 years of church history, just in this church alone. Uh, we've had a, a pastor who got involved in a messy divorce, and that gutted this church almost 20 years ago. It literally just, it, it gutted the church. <coughs> then we had another pastor who decided to steal $60,000 worth of bushfire money. <laughs> And that could have absolutely destroyed this church if it ever got out into the... Eh? He was from the other church. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, also in this church, we, we've had people with personality disorders that have done all sorts of trouble. We've had, and this is on the public record, we actually had a Christian teacher here at one stage who seduced a girl who was 15 years old and went to prison. Not at this church. It happened oh, not yet, yeah, not in this church, but he actually came to this church here and he was full of great theological points and uh, didn't mind telling you and correcting you on your sermons and it's like, didn't you just get out of jail? <laughs> you were married? And it was like there was no cohesion or no con connection between what he did and his Christian walk with God. And look, I could go on and on and ask yourself, we're all praying and we're saying, God save me, but like, what's going on? What's going on when the church is just filled with, with so much blatant sin? And the answer is simple. We're all a bit like me. We want to go fishing, but we don't follow the rules. We don't even bother to look at our petrol tank. We don't put our life jackets on. We don't check the... The, the, the seaworthiness of our vessels. And Christians are the same. We've got so many who are saved by faith, yet are still bound in the chains of demons, of addictions, of all sort of disorders and problems. And there are so many stories as Christians we could say who are saved yet need saving. And I'm sure all of us could tell our own stories. Yes? No? I'm sure we all could. I'm sure we've all got our own personal demons that we've wrestled with. And we cry out, Lord, I'm saved by faith, but why am I bound? Like, why am I wrestling with these demons? And if Christ is our salvation, then why am I so often ensnared in the trap of the fowler? Or I get myself into so much trouble? And the answer is simple. Christ is our salvation. Amen? amen. Can I hear a big amen? amen. Is he, Christ is our salvation, is he not? Yes. 
Did he not die on the cross for our salvation? Did he not die and shed his blood so our sins would be forgiven? Our sins are forgiven, aren't they? Yes. And we are justified before God, are we not, brothers and sisters? Yes. Amen. All right, let's get on our black voices and amen, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is like one of those Southern American churches. And, and we can say it with conviction and mean it. Amen? Yeah, amen. Let's push on. Acts chapter 4. Peter stands up and says, There is no other name under heaven by which men must, must be saved. Whose name is that? Jesus. Jesus. Every epistle starts with almost two, three, four chapters of the writer of the epistle saying, You're justified by faith. You're adopted sons and daughters. You've been called by the Most High. You have been called out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Every epistle, they stand up and they go, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. You're adopted, you're adopted, you're justified, you're sanctified. You are the righteousness of God. And all of us go, hallelujah. We read the first parts of the epistle and we get excited, don't we? And we all go about saying, I am saved, Jesus saves me. It's, it's the biggest cliche that we can find in the church today. Every sermon, Christ is the chosen one. Every sermon that was preached in the book of Acts, it starts with Peter or Paul saying, Christ was God's chosen one and you nailed him to the cross, but Christ resurrected him from the dead. Why? To prove that he is the saviour of the world. Every sermon started with that proposition. Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of what? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Is it the power of God unto salvation? Yes, Brothers is. and sisters, do we really believe this? Yes. Are we sure we believe this? Yes. We've got to be convinced of this. Paul would say, by grace you are what? You are saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Could the New Testament get any clearer that Christ is our salvation, that we are dependent upon his grace, that there is no bragging, there is no boasting, it is by his mercy alone. Church, can I hear an amen? Amen. All right. <clears throat> Yet after all these pronouncements, every epistle comes with warnings, instructions, and commandments, which if I was to summarize it, literally would say, church, get your act together. <laughs> If I was to summarise the, the commandments by Peter and Paul, they would look at the church and say, guys, for the love of God, start acting as though you are saved. You've only got to read the book in the church of Corinthians. Here is a church that Paul says, no, you're not. You are the, the what? The, the temple of the Holy Spirit? That's what Paul said, didn't he? Yet the Corinthian church was riddled with factions. At communion, they got drunk. They were divorcing their husbands and wives. They were eating the meat of idols and bragging about it before their weaker Christians. I could go on and on and on. And you'd go to that church and you'd think, hey, this is the most seedious church I've ever been to. Imagine rocking on up the church and you're greeted by the deacon who's sloshed. Because he's had too much communion. Or you go to the love feast, you know, the love feast table. And you go there and everyone's just oh, 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 gorging themselves and you get there and you go without. And you'd think, what sort of Christians are these? Hungry. Hungry Christians. <laughs> the Corinthian church was saved, yet Paul would come in with the most scolding letters saying, guys, I've got, to, I've got to kick one of you guys out of the church. It's so bad. He's sleeping with your mother-in-law. And you guys don't even think there's anything wrong with that. Paul, likewise, would write to the Galatian church and rebuke it. And Paul wouldn't even bother with his customary greeting. You know how every letter is, you write a letter and you butter people up first. You'd be very nice and 
You say how wonderful you are before you get in and rebuke them. We all understand that, don't we? But Paul just jumps into the letter and just goes, you beloved idiots, you foolish Galatians who has bewitched you. Are they saved? Yes. They're saved, aren't they? Yes. Paul knows they're saved. Then why do we need these instructions? Why do we need these rebukes? Paul, who was not ashamed of the power of salvation, is also not ashamed of the instructions that go along with that salvation. And these are the instructions of God for our salvation. And these are the Proverbs that we are starting to look at today. And we must come and look at the Proverbs as, as Daniel preached on last week. We come and we look at them through the eyes of the fact that we're already saved. We are already Christians. But nonetheless, you don't just go, well, I'm saved now. I don't need these Proverbs because I'm a pretty smart dude. And the answer, sadly to say, is no, we're not. We're so dumb, we'll go fishing without fuel in our tank. We're so silly, we'll go up four-wheel tracks with our road tyres on. We're so foolish that we'll go to church and get involved in factions and split the church. That's how dumb we are. And that's why we need the instructions of the Word of God. And in that light, therefore, church... We must view the Proverbs as the instructions of God on how to live. Are we not called out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Correct? Yeah. Who called us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? God in Jesus. The king, did he not? <laughs> now, where in the kingdom of light does that not mean that we have a king? Yes. Now, now, who's the king? Jesus. Jesus. Who wrote the Bible? God, Jesus. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the same King. The point is, the Bible is the written word of God. Amen. Literally written by King Holy Spirit, who is one with King Jesus, who is one with King the Father. The three are one. Now, why did we get into the situation in the first place? Well, it was all Eve's fault. <laughs> it happened to be all Adam's fault as well. But in the story in Genesis, where is the origins of all things, we see the origins of foolishness. And the origins of foolishness was simply that Eve reached out for the knowledge and actually found foolishness. Did not Satan come to tempt us? And to tempt us with this one thing, that you too can be wise, you too can be like God, if you just reach out and eat of the tree of what? Of good and, and bad, you too will know knowledge. But in that one act, you did the very most foolish thing you could ever do, and that is disobey the very one who is the light of the world and who is the wisdom of all things personified God himself. You, did you see the irony in it? In trying to become God, we've lost our holiness. In trying to extend ourselves beyond who and what we are, we actually became worse. And that is the definition of foolishness. Her pursuit for wisdom and our pursuit for wisdom, to be like God was flawed because it was based on a lie. It was based on a deception. And that deception is that you should be something more than you actually are. The Proverbs comes along. And it says these things. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and discipline. To comprehend the words of insight. To receive instructions in wise living, in righteousness, justice and equity. And to impart prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and gain instruction. And the discerning, acquire.
acquire wise counsel to understand the proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. There it is, church. Here's King Solomon, the son of David, saying that there is much to learn. Now, who here is so smart that they know everything? Can I just see your hands? <laughs> You're a nurse, you can get away with anything. <laughs> Only if I've got Google. <laughs> now, we, we all have at least a little bit of humility to say that we don't know everything, do, don't we? At least in public. In private, with our wives and our kids, we may, we may talk about, like, I have an opinion and I know everything. But the truth of the matter is we know in public we're supposed to go, yes, we don't know everything. And what does that mean? Well, it's true. Our starting position is foolishness, stupidity, dumb. And the Bible comes along and says, let me instruct you in how to live. And if you follow these instructions, you'll be prudent. You will have discretion. You'll... you'll basically get the keys to life on how to live. Now, do we need those keys, brothers and sisters? Just have a look around us. Look at where we are today. Look at the churches everywhere. It's like never in the history of the church has the church been so dynamically vocal, yet so dysfunctional. I've never seen Facebook so filled with Christian memes and slogans and, and cliches. Yet at the same time, behind all those cliches and scripture verses, it's just you, you, you nod your head and just go, I've never seen the church so dysfunctional. We know what dysfunctionality is, don't we? It's when something that's functional is broken. Verse 7 sums up our approach to these instructions, our approach to wisdom. And it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And as Daniel preached last week, that's what the Proverbs is all about. It's just like foolishness and wisdom. Choose A, choose B. Choose this scenario, choose that scenario. Sleep in, you'll grow poor. Talk too much, you'll sin. Rebuke the king and you'll get in trouble. Uh, let your tongue be used for flattery and you'll find yourself in deep doo-doo. And the Proverbs just goes on and on and on. But the presupposition behind it all is simply this, that if you fear the Lord, you will find knowledge. Adam and Eve, when they reached out to gain knowledge, the reason why they didn't find it is because they didn't fear the Lord. They didn't fear the Lord. In fact, what they did was they listened to the voice of the enemy. They listened to the voice of a liar. They listened to the voice of the demons, of the deception, of the darkness and they chose to follow that voice instead of the voice of the living one, of the light of the world. And in doing so, they choose foolishness. And in that foolishness, they became dysfunctional as human beings. And one of the first things you notice about a dysfunctional human being is they're like, whoops, I'm ashamed, I'm naked. And then we spend the rest of our lives trying to justify that shame and nakedness. And once you're on the pathway of trying to justify yourself, everyone becomes your competitor, everyone becomes your enemy, and it's, a, it's like survivor. It's like you divide up into little groups, and it's just like, Lynn, do you want to be on my team? Let's get Neil on board. He's on our team. And, and it's all good, and then something turns, it's just like, oh, I'm going to drop Lynn and get Crystal on my team instead. And literally that's what life is like. We spend our whole lives just making a, a, allegiances and making enemies with people just simply so that we can live in this delusional bubble that we're justifying. And if anyone comes along and dares to prick it, if anyone dares to come along and go, you know, you, you're not justified, you've actually got problems here, 
The word of God says that two plus two equals four, and you're going, no, two plus two equals five. And it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's not true. Then it's like, off with your head, you villain. Where does it all come down to? It comes down to this one simple expression. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. And so church, our application is simple. We are saved. We are justified. We are everything you want that you can think of in those nice little scripture readings you get in the New Testament. All the things that we are in Christ. And you can name them all and you can say in Christ we are hid in Christ and this is our great treasure. We know them well, don't we? But that salvation does not for one minute change the word of God. And the word of God says that if you do not fear the Lord, if you do not fear the Lord, you will not gain knowledge nor will you gain wisdom. But that, that salvation... Salvation does not one minute change the word of the Lord. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and a salvation that does not leave you with the fear of God as the power of God that Paul is not ashamed of is not, perhaps it's not even salvation. If you've had an experience with God and I don't care what it is, but if it hasn't left you in the correct position, I will now demonstrate the correct position of salvation. It's this. Yes, my liege. Yes, my lord. Yes, my king. That's it. If you're strutting around in this position in your walk with God, telling God what he should do for you, then I suggest you're not in the correct position at all. And I suggest that you probably haven't even encountered the living God. Because if you had encountered the living God at Calvary, it would be a fearsome and awesome thing to see a God that would not spare his son for our salvation. How therefore would he spare us in our arrogance and disrespect? And so it's all about this. We either fear God or we're fools. They are the two pathways that we are left with. And unfortunately for many Christians today, there is a sense that once we've been saved, that once we've been adopted by God, then somehow we, we no longer need to fear God. And fear God is just simply reverence and respect. I understand the scripture that says that perfect love casts out all fear. But that's a different word. That's a different context. That's a completely different meaning. The word of God still stands today. The fear of the Lord must be predominant in our lives. And people of God, I want to conclude with this thought. There is no distinction for the Christian between the message of grace and the message found in the good news of the New Testament and the words of instruction for life found in the Proverbs. They're not two separate games that we're playing. It's one and the same God. And when I say the word game, you've all played a board game, haven't you? What happens if you play a board game and you decide to change the rules? People get very annoyed at you, don't they? Crystal gets annoyed. <laughs> hey? Crystal gets annoyed. Yeah, you can imagine playing Monopoly with someone. All of a sudden, someone just starts going, no, no, I'm not going to jail. I'm the righteousness in Christ. <laughs> I don't need to go to jail. It's like, do you think people are going to want to play Monopoly with you? And so it is in life. God is the king. He has his rules. He has his levels of ethics to follow. And we're actually told to be perfect like he is perfect and to follow in his example that he has set for us. See, both are issues of salvation. Both are issues of salvation from the powers of darkness, the enemies of God that would hold you captive. 
The instructions of God without the salvation of the cross will leave you condemned and guilty. I think we all know that, don't we? If all we have is the, the instructions from God, which is his laws and his commandments, without the salvation of Jesus Christ, we all know we're cactus. Agree? But equally, you can have the salvation of God, but you then still ignore his commands and his rules and his kingship. If you still despise the wisdom and the discipline of God's instructions, then Proverbs labels you a fool. Perhaps you're a Christian fool. Perhaps you're a saved fool. I don't know if these two are compatible, but let's just say they are. Then literally we have a case where we could have a church filled with a lot of fools. Because we're not adhering to the wisdom and the instructions of the Proverbs nor the commandments of Christ, nor the ethics of the kingdom of God. Ignore God's word, saved or not saved, washed in the blood or not washed in the blood, spirit-filled, hand-waving, Facebook-memeing Christian, quoting the Bible, yet we can still be a fool if we are simply not following the Proverbs, the instructions, and the commandments of God today. Save me, I said at the start. God's Bible basically says, okay, it throws the instruction book down to us, it hits us in the head, <laughs> and it's like, read it. Read it. And you won't get into trouble. No different to me out in the boat, without my life jacket on, with not be throwing the anchor in, without any fuel in my tank. I'm sure the surf rescue would come along and they would grab the basics of boating and throw it at my head and say, read it. And we won't need to come and save you next time. And likewise to God, yes, Christ is our saviour. We know that. But the Holy Spirit comes and he brings God's word to us. And he'll slap us in the head with it and say, you want to be saved from your dysfunctionality? Read it. Read it. What does the Bible say about taking your brothers and sisters to the court? It says, don't do it. And you would save yourself a whole lot of trouble. What does the Bible say about factions in the church? It says, they're wrong. Don't do it. Read it. It would save yourself a whole lot of trouble. What does the Bible say about pride? It says it goes before a fall. Read it. Don't become proud. What does the Bible say about lying? It says don't do it. Hold your tongue. Cut your tongue out before you, before you tell a lie. Jesus would say cut your head out. Gorge your eyes out. Do whatever it takes to remove sin from your life. If we respect Jesus, if we have any ounce of respect for him whatsoever and upon what he did upon the cross, and I know we all do, we sing the songs, don't we? And we tear up. And we see what Jesus done for us. And we tear up, don't we? And we, we're filled with great love because he saved us, aren't we not? And are we not appreciated of, of the great salvation that he has for us? Then he comes to us and says, guys, I love you so much more. I've got more salvation for you even right here on planet Earth. And all you have to do is follow the rules of life. And you'll find that Jesus is even a bigger saviour than what we thought he was. Because he can save us from dysfunctionality. He can save us from strife. He can save us from our enemies and our deliverers and our frustrations. If we but pick up the book and read it and listen to the Holy Spirit, which simply says, do not go to bed angry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I better not do that. Husbands, love your wives 
Oh yeah, maybe I should do that one. <laughs> Brothers and sisters who are struggling with one another, leave your gift at the altar. Don't even come to church before you reconcile with your brother. Oh yeah, if I do that one, that would save me a lot of trouble and a lot of heartache. If we are willing to fear God, then we will do these things. But if we are not willing to do these things, then let us let the Proverbs say what it says, that we're fools. Save fools, but nonetheless, at the end of the day, we're just going to walk in dysfunctionality. Well, brothers and sisters, let me see a show of hands here. Who wants to be delivered from dysfunctionality? Who's, who's had enough of living in the chains and the bondage of the enemy? Who wants God to be their mighty deliverer? We all do, don't we? Well, God says sometimes you've got to walk around the city seven times and blow a trumpet. And uh, we don't know why we've got to do that, but, but you know that, that they did it. Well, in the New Testament, God gives us commands and instructions which actually make sense. And we understand what they do. And if we would just but follow them, we could have a mighty victory in our families. We could have a mighty victory with our friends. We could have mighty victories in the church if we would but just listen to the Proverbs and the wisdom of God and allow them to sink into our little numbskull brains. <laughs> and instead of going out fishing without fuel in our tanks, we would have a wisdom and a fear that would make sure that we're living and playing the Christian game by God's rules and by his book. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wisdom. And we thank you that you are the beginning of wisdom. And before anything else, God, we ask that you would wrestle us on this one simple point. Do we respect you? Do we fear you? Do we truly believe you to be the king of who you say you are? then God, bring us back to the cross. Bring us back to our first love. Remind us of the, the great power that you poured out from heaven when you rose Jesus from the dead. Remind us of this great salvation, Father, so that we would indeed take you seriously in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that concludes today's...